This is part two of a lecture for professional responsibility about legal malpractice. And uh, um, now, of course, we could do a whole course on legal malpractice actions, but we're trying to do just the basics that everybody needs to know when they finish law school and that you probably need to know for the MPRE in case they ask about it. They do sometimes ask a few questions about legal malpractice. It's not a heavily tested subject. Um, but it could be tested. If you're looking for um, rules about this, we don't really have model rules from the ABA apart from 1.8H, which is about waivers and settling cases. Um, but we do have a lot of restatement sections about legal malpractice um, that are very useful. And I strongly urge students to read through once, at least before um, before your MPRE and also just in connection with my course. Okay, let's talk about what are your defenses available when you're sued for malpractice. So one would be that the attorney reasonably believed that the action was required by law or an ethics rule. And so the, the client says, well, why did you violate attorney-client privilege or um, uh, or my, your duty of confidentiality to me? And you could say, because the I was under a court order to make the disclosure. I, ha I had no choice and I made my, all my arguments I could um, and I lost. Um, and so, uh, it, or you had a conflict of interest and you had to withdraw from the representation. And it was an unexpected conflict that arose after the representation had, had begun. And so now you have to withdraw from the representation and you believed that, so you took that action. Okay, second, there's some sort of comparative or contributory, contributory negligence, and you must have covered this in your first year torts class. And this happens with clients, right? Sometimes they, they, you're going to find that some of your clients are very frustrated and they don't comply with discovery requests. They don't turn over and give you information you need. You're going to have, I hate to say this, when you're in practice, you are going to have clients lie to you. Um, and string you along. And um, if you're bad about procrastinating, um, uh, dropping stuff off and running errands, wait till you see what your clients are like. And so the client um, sometimes is your worst enemy for taking care of the client. Um, and then also there can be things like assumption of risk or failure to mitigate. And so um, that you told the client that this was a long shot case or um, that there were uh, serious risks with pursuing this type of cause of action with counterclaims or being on the hook for attorney's fees, um, the other side's attorney's fees and so on, and they assumed the risk. Okay, this is a difficult part, which is about the statute of limitations. And th this is, it takes, it requires a little more um, intensive study or thought about, that's one of the hardest areas of legal malpractice. Um, and, and by the way, if you can't remember this, I'm going to cut to the bottom line. Client, we find a whole bunch of ways for the client to win on the statute of limitations. We stretch the rule in favor of the client every, in every direction. Um, so first of all, the statute of limitations will not run on a client's ca um, claim while the lawyer continues to represent the client. And so if you uh, have a matter that takes two years of you representing the client and you committed malpractice at the beginning of the representation, um, the stat relevant statute of limitations doesn't even start to run until the day your representation ends, right? Which means it gives your client more time. It also doesn't start to run until the lawyer dis either discloses the supposed malpractice to the client or the client knows or reasonably should know that the malpractice occurred. And sometimes lawyers do things and it takes a long time for it to be evident that they committed malpractice. And it also doesn't start to run until the alleged malpractice significantly injures the plaintiff. I'm going to tell you a story. Um, when I was a new lawyer, I was part of a, a, a denomination, a, a church, a, a group of churches that were getting started in, in the United States. They were planting churches. Um, uh, they ended up prim primarily among immigrant communities. And, um, and I was the only lawyer in their dozen or so churches that they had in, uh, in this country at, at the time. And I was a new lawyer. And they had a situation come up with one of their local churches that had been incorporated. They'd gone to a, a local, it was out in the country, and they'd gone to a local lawyer to do their business setup when they started their church. And this had been um, 15 or 16 years prior. And that person had no idea what he was doing. What he was doing, he had never incorporated a church before or a, a, a tax exempt nonprofit, and um, and so he did it like he would normally do a business. And and the the state kicked back his forms. 
uh, one time and, and stuff like that. And he basically did everything wrong. He had no idea what he was doing. He did everything wrong. It's not rocket science. I mean, it's not that hard to fill out the forms for um, setting up nonprofits and getting tax exemption, but it's also, it's a lot, you could check the wrong box or not file the right, right form. You don't know what you're doing. And he did it all wrong. And so, um, and one of those uh, aspects of this was um, the, the, this church at the time they formed had a, an opportunity to buy a parcel of land and a building to have their church building in. And, um, and this lawyer didn't know that under the local rules, the, the rules in his jurisdiction, um, in order to qualify for a property tax exemption, you had to file forms within a certain deadline, like 30 days or 60 days after the transfer of title to a nonprofit. Otherwise, the nonprofit is not just automatically exempt from property taxes. Please understand, churches are kind of automatically exempt from paying income tax on their corporate income, the offerings that they um, collect. And, um, but they're not automatically exempt from property taxes. They're most jurisdictions, you have to file paperwork by a certain deadline after buying a piece of property to declare that you, are, that you meet the requirements to be exempt from property. I hadn't done that. And what happened is the local town or county waited 16 years and then um, started, brought a, a, a threatened legal action against the church for, not, for having 16 years of unpaid property tax. And, um, and this came as a shock to the denomination, like what's going on? How could we owe this huge amount of money in unpaid um, property taxes, local property taxes? And some of them thought we shouldn't have to pay this at all because we're a church. And, and eventually we negotiated our way out of the situation with the town or the county, but there was no question that the lawyer who, who set this up had committed malpractice. And there was also, no question that no one would have known, none of the lay people involved in, in setting up the church would have had any way to know that he hadn't filed the form until many years later when all of a sudden they're, they're served with this enormous property tax bill for 16 years of unpaid property taxes. And this happens more than you think, where a lawyer forgets to perfect a security interest, um, forgets to... Uh, uh, renew a license um, or, or something like that. And years later, and so when does the statute of limitations st um, begin running? When we find out that the lawyer screwed up. Okay, that's the, the upside of that. Okay, vicarious liability. A law firm is civilly liable for injuries caused by an employee or principal of the firm who is acting in the ordinary course of the firm's business with actual or apparent authority. In other words, the firm could be sued for what one of the malpractice committed by its lawyers. If the law firm is organized as a partnership, and I don't want to spend too much time on partnership and corporations law, but without limited liability, each partner can be liable jointly and severably, severably, uh, severally, sorry, um, with the firm. This is vicarious liability. Um, a lot of firms nowadays are limited liability firms. They're either LLCs or LLPs. And this, the firm remains vicariously liable for injuries caused by an employee or principal, but the principals of the firm are not personal, personally responsible for negligence, which they did not participate personally or as their supervisors. So if you've had corporations law or business organizations law, um, this is, uh, sounds, must sound super simple to you. If you haven't, this may sound complicated. Believe it or not, they do ask a, a question or two on, about this on some of the MPRE um, administrations. And so... Um, just be aware and, and just have the basic bottom line rule for firms can be liable and what's the difference between partnership and an LLC or an LLP in terms of who's liable. Okay, what about privilege? The majority view, and this is the traditional view, and, and so this should be your MPRE answer, is that if a current outside client threatened the firm with a malpractice claim, the attorney client, um, the attorney um, client privilege does not apply to consulta consultations between firm members representing the client and in-house counsel responsible for issues such as ethics and risk management. And so you go and talk to other lawyers in your firm about the case, those conversations are not going to be privileged if it's your client suing you. Um, so in any ma uh, subsequent malpractice litigation, the former client could discover um, any written records um, of the internal consultations and depose firm members about related oral 
communication. So note that uh, there may be a new trend emerging away from this, a modern trend in the other direction, but this is the traditional view and the majority view and the one you should assume if you have a question about this. Okay, what about um, uh, corporations? Uh, uh, this is warnings from the malpractice insurers who actually pay the bills. Avoid becoming a director, officer, or shareholder of a corporation while also acting as a corporation's lawyer. Um, and uh, this dual role can create all kinds of problems um, uh, to, that include the loss of attorney-client privilege and increased risk of malpractice claims and an inability to participate in certain decisions. Um, it's very common that if you're in-house counsel or even outside counsel for a firm, that they'll ask you to serve on the board um, and because it's useful, you have a lot of useful knowledge and uh, it, uh, for board discussions when you can say, oh, you can't do that because of legal liability or something like that. Um, but it is a minefield for malpractice. If you do find yourself on a corporate board, do not further compound the conflict issues by taking an ownership interest that ex in the company that exceeds 5%. Sometimes they pay um, compensate board members in shares of stock in order to give them uh, to align their interests with the corporation or give them skin in the game. Um, be careful. And then at that point, the conflict problems reach a point where malpractice carriers were all, will often exclude your risk. And so if you are carrying malpractice insurance, um, it probably won't cover you anymore if you have taken um, more than a 5% ownership share in your client's business. Play it safe and don't take any financial interest uh, if you wanna play it safe in a um, client's entity because it's difficult to prove later that you never put your financial interests above your own clients. Never also, here's another one, never solicit investors on behalf of your client's business, right? Some clients will ask you to try to find people um, who would be interested in investing in their business, capitalizing it. And if and when the business goes south, you'll be the one targeted for recovery of all the losses and malpractice policies won't cover investment advice. And so if you either advised your client on how to deal with these investors or um, talked up your client to other clients, encouraging them to invest, right? So your idea of who to talk to and, and where to find investors is to talk to your other clients. Well, now what you're doing is financial advice and your malpractice policies probably don't cover that. Um, and also remember that your personal ownership interest inversely correlates with the independence of your um, legal judgment. Malpractice insurance, very quickly. The ABA model rules do not require lawyers to carry malpractice. This is a common misperception I find even among law professors. Um, and so you don't have to have malpractice insurance. Only, um, to my knowledge, one or two states require lawyers to carry malpractice insurance, although about half the states, including Texas, require that you disclose to clients at the beginning of the representation to provide notice of whether you are insured. Um, Keep in mind with malpractice insurance, there's different kinds of policies. There's ones with high deductibles or caps on coverage and things like that. Just like any other type of insurance, you get what you pay for. Um, okay, so enough about that. Now, here's something about insurance that's a little tricky. We have a, um, a couple terms that you probably should know about, not only for the MPRE, but just in practice. There's the old type of um, uh, claim of insurance policies were occurrence policies. These used to be more common. And these covered lawyers for acts or um, omissions during the policy term, regardless of when the, uh, when the claim was asserted. And sometimes a lot of casualty in insurance in, for other areas besides malpractice is like this, right? So if you have some sort of a casualty insurance um, uh, for injuries, for accidents, um, it's going to cover you while you're covered by, cover the injuries that arise while you're covered under the policy. Um, most, uh, uh, the vast majority of um, legal malpractice uh, insurance policies now are what's called claims made policies. This is the modern trend that if you have legal malpractice insurance, if you buy it after you graduate from law school, this is probably what you're gonna get. This covers the lawyer for unforeseen claims made that where the claims are made during the policy period, regardless of whether when the incident occurred, but you better believe it's going to exclude the equivalent of pre-existing conditions. It's going to exclude pre-existing malpractice. 
And so if you've changed jobs or insurers, you may need supplemental prior acts or tail coverage um, to prevent gaps in your um, policy applicability. So law firms that have malpractice liability, basically the, what the insurer agrees to do is just cover the claims that come in while they have the policy. Why? Um, because the other kind, the casual, casual because, because a lot of times legal malpractice takes years, sometimes decades. Be, remember the statute of limitations issues before we know that the lawyer uh, uh, um, committed malpractice and that there's a claim. And so you don't, we don't want to have this issue like we did under the old policies where somebody hasn't, this insurance company hasn't even covered you in 10 years and now you're asking them to indemnify you uh, for a malpractice lawsuit. Um, when when you let your policy lapse, and so um, a long time ago, and you switched insurers, and so now uh, what we do is we cover the claims that come in while we're covering you, not claims um, for malpractice uh, that uh, um, that were committed um, uh, before, and also, but keep in mind that it's only going to cover the lawyers like as of the day they started working there. It's going to exclude um, the covering uh, the lawyers for malpractice that they committed at previous places of employment. Um, the American uh, Bar Association has a cute little cartoon video about insurance, and I will show it um, in a live session of my class probably. And, um, or uh, you should click on the link in my slides and, um, and watch the ABA's a video about tail insurance. Okay, that concludes our second lecture about legal malpractice.